today on For the Record. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this I gave y'all 30 years of my around. R. Kelly explodes, proclaiming his innocence in his first interview since his arrest. Andrea Kelly, your ex-wife, Kitty Jones, Lisa Van Allen, Lizette Martinez, Geronda Pace, Faith Rogers, Asante McGee. You're saying everything they said in that documentary about you is not true. They are lying on me. We examine all angles of Kelly's interview and the criminal case against him, starting now. This is not about music! I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids, and I can't do it! Yikes. Um, that's, <laughs> so that was a performance. It was a breakdown. It was whatever you want to call it. But we will discuss it with an awesome panel of songwriter, singer-songwriter R. Kelly. Uh, I never heard of this guy. I'm not going to lie to you up until a couple of weeks ago. But uh, now I've done some research on him. He's a, a producer, a songwriter. He was a former professional basketball player. In 2012, he had uh, sold a 30 million albums. I know that's pretty good. He's gotten three Grammys. You may, re may remember the song, I Believe I Can Fly. But he also has had a tremendous amount of difficulties in the criminal justice system, up to and including an acquittal on a child porn charge in 2008 and multiple numerous allegations of sexual assault with underage girls. Well, there was a documentary done, and like so many times in the media, that documentary opened up what we like to call Pandora's box. And what we now have is R. Kelly charged with 10 counts of aggregate aggravated criminal sexual assault out of Chicago for having sex with people under the age of 17 years of age, which is the age of consent. And it's just weird stuff. It's abusive. It's being held in captivity. It's being emotionally and physically brutal to these people. And you just saw a little clip there of uh, what we saw in an interview that happened today with Gail King on CBS. Look, guys, you know no one does this better than our friends at Mediaite. You got our with us today, Aiden McLaughlin. Aiden, I, I know you've been following this, and you've got some serious uh, information about this seriously distorted individual and the seriously distorted interview. This is where law, the media, and crime meets. Aiden, what's going on here? Right. So we got to remember last month, uh, R. Kelly got indicted on these 10 counts, and he's facing three to seven years for each count. So he's facing up to 70 years in prison. And uh, amongst that backdrop, he sits down with Gail King for an interview that aired on CBS News this morning. Uh, and I want you to watch. He gets quite emotional in the interview. He has an outburst. You could call it a meltdown. Uh, I want you to watch how he responds to Gail King repeatedly questioning him about these allegations. Quit playing. Robert. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this I gave you 30 years of my career! Robert. 30 years of my career! Are y'all trying to kill me? You killing me, man! This is not about music! I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids, and I can't do it! Y'all just don't want to believe the truth! You don't want to believe it! At this point, we briefly pause the interview to give Kelly a moment. His publicist helped calm him down. I hope this camera keep going. No, we're going to let the camera keep going. This is not true. This is not, doesn't even make sense. Why would I hold all these women? So, right, so Gail King has been getting plaudits for how she handled that interview. She remained pretty stoic throughout and still managed to ask R. Kelly some tough questions despite his outburst. Um, and it's important to note that he denied all of the allegations in the interview uh, despite her questioning. Now, 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 Aiden, um, I would imagine that when a lawyer or a publicist is bringing their client on in order to deny the allegations of being verbally abusive, violent, and that these women were scared, coerced into taking drugs and alcohol and having sex illicitly, that this probably isn't the best image you want to present in a controlled environment where the world is watching. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally. I mean, I don't know what the PR move is here unless he's trying to play to a certain audience, uh, I guess his supporters. Maybe, and it's, uh, it's funny you mentioned that actually. He did an interview with uh, Huffington Post back in 2014 
and he was questioned about all of these allegations. He had a, he had a similar kind of meltdown where he also commented on the looks uh, and appearance of the interviewer who is female. So he's done this before and has had a similar kind of uh, reaction. It's unclear who he's trying to uh, make his case to, but I, don't, I certainly don't think it helps him. Well, listen, our, our viewers on the Law & Crime Network, they love true crime. We're actually refiling this through and through. And from what I understand, we may have one more little snippet of a clip of him presumably trying to help himself out. But I'm not talking about the one case in which you were acquitted. I'm talking about the other cases where women have come forward mm -hmm. and said, R. Kelly had sex with me mm. when I was under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. R. Kelly was abusive to me mm -hmm. emotionally and physically and verbally. Okay. R. Kelly took me in a black room where unspeakable things happened. This is what they're saying about you. Not this, true. These, are, these aren't old rumors. Not true. Whether they're old rumors, new rumors, why would they future say this rumors, about you? Not true. Well, I'm, How I'm, stupid would it never be for anybody. R. Kelly with all I've been through in my way, way past to hold somebody, let alone four, five, six, fifty, you said. What, how stupid would I be to do that? I didn't say you That's were holding. That's stupid, guys. I didn't. Is this camera on me? Yes, it's on. That's stupid. Use your <laughs> common sense. Don't forget the blogs. Forget how you feel about me. Hate me if you want to. Love me if you want. But just use your common sense. How stupid would it be for me to, with my crazy past and what I've been through, Oh, right now, I just think I need to be a monster and hold girls against their will, chain them up in my basement, and, and don't let them eat and don't let them out unless they need some shoes down the street from their uncle. Robert, Stop it. Y'all well, quit playing. <laughs> well, I got Imran was still with me, but our very, very, very special guest, the great, the stupendous, does everything here at the Law Crime Network, Rachel Stockman. <laughs> Rachel, you had, to, you had to be here. I mean... What do you think of this? Uh, when I saw that interview, I, I guess I shouldn't be in shock, but I was in a bit of shock with how he handled himself. For one, first off, I'm sure his defense attorney vehemently opposed him going on national uh, TV. Second off, if he was going to do it, I'm sure any PR consultant would tell him to stay under control, to answer the questions politely, and he did the exact opposite of that. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of like what we say, or I've said so many times as a prosecutor, when I was cross-examining a defendant that lost their mind and the judge is clearing the jury out of the jury room, in summation, I sit there and said, if he's acting like that here with you, with his life on the line, you can only imagine what he's like in a dark room in his house with liquor and drugs. What do you think? Exactly. I mean, R. Kelly's attorney... Uh, must have been in the wing, it, it just he's having. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we know him. He's he's a guest here on Law and Crime. I can only imagine he was having a little meltdown as this was going on. Yeah, I mean, do, do you? <laughs> Sorry, you interrupt there. Yeah, no, 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 but but to that point, I mean, right. I mean, this is like the the Durst thing. You know, the guy's mic'd up. He goes into the bathroom and maybe confesses to a crime. First of all, I would never allow a client, I guess if a client absolutely insists it has to happen, but don't you get the big hook as the lawyer, just literally grab the guy and say, you are leaving. You're not going to recompose yourself, you're not going to go back on again, because every time he went back on, he flipped out again. Right. I would have loved to just shut that down and say, you know, no more, but it was sort of... You're already in too deep. He's on camera. He, you, know, you know they're going to use this uh, on television. And it's R. Kelly. Listen, it's not his first tango with the law. Uh, he's had these uh, lawsuits. He's, been, he's faced prosecution. He got acquitted. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, I mean, listen, it's crazy. Well, okay. Well, you know, listen, they're, they're, they're actually, he actually uses the defense that I was found not guilty um, so therefore, you know, you're giving me double jeopardy is what he was using. But no, that's what we call in the law 404B evidence. In other words, consistent stories, a common plan, a common scheme with multiple people that could be used to be able to prove the allegations that are brought against him right now. So um, I, I don't know. Do you think that the defense, I think the prosecutions are going to actually introduce this potentially as exhibit one or two in his trial? Right. And, you know, you're talking about prior bad access, you know, here in New York, it's Molyneux uh, evidence. And the prosecution is going to be wanting to use the prior bad acts. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'd like to know if, I don't know if Rachel, maybe there may be some sound problems or not, but, but at, at a minimum, you can get real close so she can hear, because I think this is really important. You know, as a woman, 
um, you know, we can have different points of view and perspectives on things. But from what I understand of the limited facts of this case, many of the women throughout the years were saying that they were afraid of his outbursts, his explosiveness. And to be honest with you, as a guy, I hate to, I hate to parse the sexes out, but yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, we're having a little some problems. Uh, but let me just ask real quick. Do you, do you think that that really would affect women jurors more than it would male jurors? I think it is. You know, when you're looking to select this jury, if and when this goes to trial, you're going to be really careful about what kind of jury you want. You're going to think about the gender dynamic, and you're going to be, you know, keeping all those things into consideration. Boy, oh boy, what I like to talk about that gender dynamic issue is I was contemplating this case for a trial against a guy like that. Guys, we got to go to break. Stay tuned because we still got more on R. Kelly, believe it or not. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We're not only doing law, we're not only doing R. Kelly. We play musical chairs. We do it all. We have Rachel Stockman now to my immediate left. And uh, we also have a new special guest, Dr. Carol Lieberman from Beverly Hills. I was just out there. Doctor, you are a forensic psychiatrist, a legal analyst, an expert witness of film and print fame. And I love two things about your biography when we're talking about R. Kelly. You are called the Dr. Freud of modern times, as I understand <laughs> it. That's a pretty amazing distinction. I actually may be giving you a call afterwards. Maybe you can help me out. And um, we also have, you wrote a book called Bad Boys, Why We Love Them, How We Live With Them, and When to Leave Them. So, uh, Doc, before we get to that really descriptive title of a book that may play very well into what's going on here, you clearly have those qualifications. So I want to play a short clip for you to listen to and come back to you on the other end. The one case in which you were acquitted. I'm talking about the other cases where women have come forward mm -hmm. and said, R. Kelly had sex with me mm. when I was under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. R. Kelly was abusive to me mm -hmm. emotionally and physically and verbally. Okay. R. Kelly took me in a black room where unspeakable things happened. <sighs> this is what they're saying about you. Not this, true. These, are, these aren't old rumors. Not true. Whether they're old rumors, new rumors, Why would they future say this rumors, about you? not true. Well, I'm, How I'm, stupid would never be held for R. Kelly with all I've been through in my way, way past? To hold somebody, let alone four, five, six, fifty, you said. What, how stupid would I be to do that? I didn't say you That's were holding. That's stupid, guys. I, I didn't. Is this camera on me? Yes, it's on. That's right. stupid. Use your common sense. Don't forget the blogs. Forget how you feel about me. Hate me if you want to. Love me if you want. But just use your common sense. How stupid would it be for me to, with my crazy past and what I've been through, Oh, right now, I just think I need to be a monster and hold girls against their will, chain them up in my basement, and, and don't let them eat and don't let them out unless they need some shoes down the street from their uncle. Robert, Stop it. Y'all uh, quit playing. Well, you know, I don't know. That's a defense that many people, up to including Bill Cosby, how stupid would I be? I call it arrogance. Doctor, you may call it something else because um, what is interesting to me is the question that was asked by, the, by Gail King was about the violence and the fear, and there he is acting out the way he is. What do you see from a forensic point of view? Well, first of all, yes. Um, what you were saying before, that he actually is illustrating the very kinds of things that he is uh, being accused of, his volatility, his aggressiveness, lying off the handle, um, and also a lot of paranoia and denial. Uh, you know, he says, why would I do this with my crazy pastor, you know, my, my horrible past, with all I've been through in the past, and that actually, it's his past that has caused him to do all of this. He, ha he does have a very twisted path, past. Um, first of all, he was sexually abused by an older woman from the time he was around seven or eight to around 14. And that alone uh, would make him want to control women. Here, he was a little boy under this older woman's control, her sexual abuse. And now he is what's called identifying with the aggressor. He's identifying with the person who abused him. Um, by being the aggressor in his relationship with all these women who he is 
holding hostage, essentially. And then he also had some other interesting things in his childhood. He had, at around eight years old, he had his first girlfriend. And, um, you know, they they vowed, made vows to each other and so on. I mean, uh, and she, they were playing someplace where she got pushed into the water and she was pushed down with the water and ultimately died while she was calling out his name. So he felt helpless. He couldn't save her. And uh, and that also that goes into abandonment. He doesn't want women to abandon him. I believe he has a borderline personality disorder, amongst other things. I mean, maybe he's uh, I don't know if he's abusing substances. That would certainly explain some of this behavior. Uh, also, he could be manic depressive, which would kind of go along with his paranoia. So there are a lot of psychiatric yes. um, issues going on. Also, he tells this interesting story about his mother. Uh, he was in an interview um, some time ago, and he told a story about how when he was a boy, he and his mother would go have breakfast in, uh, I think he said McDonald's, and um, they, would, they didn't have much money, and they would share coffee and uh, paste, pastry. And he would turn the cup around, so that he would drink from the side of the cup that had his mother's lipstick on it, and he was in love with his mother and asked her to marry him. Now, there mm -hmm. is, talk about Freud, well, according to Freud, yeah. there, there is a, a phenomenon of Oedipal, uh, an Oedipal phase, but the way he describes okay. all of this is beyond the normal Oedipal phase okay. and into something rather abnormal. So I just want to switch it over to Rachel for a minute. Uh, you know, being a woman, kind of getting to that question we were saying before, as a defense lawyer, would these be things that you would try to bring out during the trial? I'm not sure if they would rise to any kind of level of defense, but are you sympathetic towards that, Rachel? And moreover, what would you pick as a juror if you were defending him, female jurors or male jurors? Listen, uh, I very interesting everything the doctor has said, but I certainly don't think it raises to a level of a defense mm -hmm. uh, in this case. I think that uh, in terms of a perfect juror, I, I don't know, because, you know, there's so much history there. Um, perhaps a male juror would be better, but this is a really tough case, given these outbursts we're hearing from, his history, um, and the allegations, and the fact that two of the charges, from what I understand, there's DNA evidence linking him to what happened. Yeah, and, and it reminds me of the case in Florida, I think, with the Kennedys many years ago, where the prosecutor picked an all-female jury, and people thought that she was nuts to do that. But what she, the, I'm sorry, the defense attorney, and what they found that was that the female jurors tended to blame the, 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 the victim, if you will, because she did some things that she should have known better to do, and kind of the egged him on scenario, where the males were much more outraged because they, as male conduct, knew that this was something that was absolutely above and beyond what somebody should have done. So it really is a tricky question when you're picking a jury as to what you do for a guy like this. But I think when you show a clip, like the clip that you're showing there, I don't think if you're male or female, it's going to resonate well. I look at them seeing him in a predatory way. Do you think so? Yeah, and I do have a question for Dr. Lieberman as well. Um, really quickly, Bob, if you don't mind, if yeah, I jump sure. in. I'm just curious, you know, just based, doctor, um, on what you saw uh, in the interview, in looking into his past, how you could possibly diagnose him with something um, without actually <laughs> talking to him in person? Well, I'm certainly not claiming that I actually uh, examined him or evaluated him, but um, from my years of experience and from putting his childhood together, the things that I talked about in regard to his childhood and what that usually brings out in a person later on, as well as his behavior in the interview. You know, there was a longer, it was a longer interview than the clips that you've shown so far. So putting that together, yes, of course, with the caveat that this is without my having met him or uh, evaluated him for 10 hours. Well, okay, well, you know what? I think that what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at one more clip and we'll be back on the other end. Quit playing. Robert. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this. I gave y'all 30 years of my career. Robert. 30 years of my career. Y'all trying to kill me. You're killing me, man. This is not about music. I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids, and I can't do it.
Y'all just don't want to believe the truth. You don't want to believe it. At this point, we briefly pause the interview to give Kelly a moment. His publicist helped calm him down. I hope this camera keep going. No, we're going to let the camera keep true. going. This is not true. This is not, doesn't even make sense. Why would I hold all these women? Yeah, re real quick, Doctor, just to follow up on what Rachel was saying, in addition to a clinical interview that you would do in your years of experience, there would be diagnostic testing that would be done from him that is kind of typically difficult for him to malinger on. You, do you believe that that diagnosis testing, diagnostic testing is imperative prior to coming to an ultimate conclusion as to what his sequelae is? No. Um, I don't, you know... <laughs> I was trained as a psychiatrist at NYU Bellevue and um, and actually uh, at the Freudian Clinic in, in London. And if we needed to have psychological testing for every patient before making a diagnosis, you know, we'd be bad psychiatrists. But when I do my expert witness work and I testify, I usually do or have done psychological testing mainly for the jury, not for me, not because it always comes out to what I had thought in the first place. But I do it for the jury because juries like to know that there is some kind of so-called objective evidence of whatever it is that you're saying so, doctor, as well. If I'm hearing you correctly, as a treating physician, which we know is clearly different than an expert in court, you, you, what more would you need other than what you've told us now in order to make the treating uh, diagnosis, even though you may not need the uh, actual ob objective testing that you would as a forensic expert in court. What else would you need? Well, you know, as a treating doctor, I would be seeing him over uh, time, you know, once or twice a week uh, for for years. And so when you're treating, you kind of, um, uh, other than the fact that you might want to give him some medication to for his rage outbursts, but other than that, you would be kind of... Um, uh, deciding as you go along, you would be looking at him in much more depth. There wouldn't be a reason necessarily as a treating doctor to make an immediate diagnosis that you hold on to. It's what he needs, what he needed actually for many years, or he, so he wouldn't be in this mess, is to have been in treatment, long-term treatment. Right. Rachel, uh, he, he's bringing up this double jeopardy issue. Uh, which obviously, I, I don't know if we need to get into the confusion of, uh, he's essentially, I guess, trying to say in layman's terms, I'm being accused of something that I was acquitted for, but we all know that an acquittal, i.e. that you can't prove a case to 12 jurors beyond a reasonable doubt, does not mean you didn't do it. Well, no, and, and it's not only that. These accusations that have come out and he's now facing charges with are completely different accusations mm -hmm. and involve different victims from the previous charges he was acquitted from. So clearly double jeopardy does not apply to this situation. Um, and the fact that he's bringing this up as some kind of defense, in all honesty, is a bit ridiculous. Okay, well, Imran, I'm now charging you with the responsibility of being the defense attorney for this uh this gentleman here, and what is your advice to him going forward about doing any more interviews, or how would you start to prepare his defense? Okay, so first, no more interviews, because you're laying down a track, uh, track record for the prosecution to use that at trial, if it goes to trial, and you're making yourself just, it's not a good look, you already don't have a good look in the court of public opinion, don't make it worse. So no more press interviews as much as you'd like to. Uh, in terms of preparing for the defense, well, we're gonna look at each of these individuals making claims. Uh, I would hire a private investigator to go out and sort of, you know, cull together some material for the defense and go from there. Wow, listen, you guys have been amazing guests. Doctor, thank you so much. It was a great education. We really appreciate you being on the Law and Crime Network. You gave us a lot of great insight. I can already tell from the chatters. They love what you had to say. Whew. Man, we got a lot left. You're welcome. And we'll be right back after the break.